name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Nagel. Thank you to all of you for being here this evening. My name is Father Leon Pereira. I'm a Dominican friar and a priest, and I belong to the English province. And for the last four years, I've been living in a place called Medjugorje, in the country of Bosnia and Herzegovina in Central Europe. Now, Medjugorje is this place where since the 24th of June, 1981, it is alleged that the Blessed Virgin Mary has been appearing to six children. I call them children. The youngest is my age, which is, well, never mind, I won't reveal my age. But they're in their 40s and 50s, okay? And it is, as Father said, a place of pilgrimage. People go there. A lot of people go there. I first went there in 1991. I grew up in Singapore. Um, I know I don't sound like I might have grown up in Singapore. I lived most of my life in England, hence the accent. Do I sound posh? <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I grew up in Singapore, and when I finished high school, in Singapore, when you finish high school, you have to join the army if you're a boy. The girls always get away with murder, so the girls all run off to college. But the boys have to go into the army for two and a half years. So I was in infantry for two and a half years. I broke my spine in two places, and then I had to have an operation. There's a metallic thing inside me fixing me together. And then that was the stage after the operation that I first went to Medjugorje. I already believed in Medjugorje because a few years before that um, I heard about Medjugorje and completely regained my faith thanks to Medjugorje. I, I grew up in a Catholic family, you have to understand. We prayed the rosary every night before dinner. I remember this clearly because, you know, when I was a kid, sometimes it was a struggle because, you know, it meant we had to miss the first half an hour of Battlestar Galactica. Uh, in favor of the rosary, the old version, the older Battlestar Galactica. Anyway, um, so it was a very Catholic atmosphere that I grew up in. But when I was about 17, I semi-lapsed. I fell in with a group of evangelical Protestants. I did the whole happy clappy, wave your hands in the air like you just don't care business. I'm much better now. I'm cured. <laughs> okay. But what drew me back was Medjugorje. Medjugorje opened my eyes to the Church Fathers, the sacred tradition. And when I came back to the faith, I was furious. I was angry because I thought, how come I was never taught the faith properly? You know, after Vatican II, this whole, I don't know how many generations it's been, two, three generations after Vatican II, we haven't really been taught the faith. We were taught all sorts of nonsense. You know, oh, the Mass is a party, it's a gathering of friends, all that kind of rubbish. Complete and utter rubbish, right? Do you think it's rubbish? It is, of course it's rubbish. Think about it. Any child with half a brain can think, I know a party which is much more fun. I know a gathering of friends which is far more congenial. We need to tell people the truth about the Mass. You know, but I'll come to that later. I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, I wish I had been taught exciting stuff like Trinity, Incarnation, Grace, Redemption, Sacraments, Mariology. These kind of things grip a child's imagination. It's only silly grown-ups who say, oh, no, no, it's too complicated for a child. Absolute, utter rubbish. 
Children love to know where everything fits. And we should teach them the truth instead of feelings and just and, and watering down CCD, is that what you guys call it here? CCD? Catechesis? To social justice issues and nothing more. And we're de depriving them of the faith. If you can see that I'm getting a bit animated and angry, I am. I am. And I remember at that time I prayed to God and I said, please, Lord, make sure that I never, ever become a heretic again. And that's why God made me into a Dominican and not a Jesuit. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Anyway, all right. So the soundness of the faith is something utterly important. It is important, period. But it's also important to me. And as I said, I owe this to Medjugorje. So I, the first time I went was 91. Um, and I was a pious young man already by that stage. I was 20 years old when I went. I did not go looking for signs and wonders. I am not keen on such things. A lot of such things are reported. You know, you, Catholics can get very enthusiastic and they kind of get, from my perspective, which I think is the correct one, they get certain things in the wrong order. For example, let me say this to you, put it this, put it this way. What would be more spectacular to you? Me walking on water or me drinking a glass of water? What's more spectacular? Did you say both? Walking on water. Yeah, of course, it is. Now, what is more amazing? Jesus walking on water or Jesus asking the Samaritan woman at the well for a drink? Okay, I know you've all gone quiet because you're thinking, it sounds like the same. Is it a trick question? It must be a trick question. Of course it's a trick question. It is. What's more spectacular? Well, first of all, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Feel free. Son of God. Is he God? Yes, Jesus is God. Now, Jesus, therefore, is the one through whom and for whom and by whom every single molecule of water in the entire universe was made. So what's more spectacular and what's more astounding? The fact that he can walk on water, you'd expect him to do, be able to do that, or the fact that he asks for a drink. Exactly. I think it's far more astounding that he asked for a drink when he made every single molecule of water in the entire universe. Now, the reason I say this is, what I'm trying to say in my own clumsy way is, look for the deeper truth. Look for what's genuinely more spectacular. So if someone said to you, you know, they went up and received communion, and when they received communion, they saw angels coming out of the pillars and spinning around and throwing out all sorts of colors and things like that, what should you tell them? Well, I'm not sure what you should tell them. I know you have to like nod politely and say, that's marvelous or something, but really what is more amazing is the fact that they receive communion because communion is really Jesus. That's really Jesus there. It's not just a symbol, not just a spiritual presence. It's really, truly our Lord and Savior, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So the fact that they receive God is far more amazing than the fact that they saw angels coming out of the pillars, right? So that's important. So whenever anyone talks about signs that they might have seen, a sign, by definition, must point to a reality. A sign to Bedford, Indiana, points to Bedford. It is not actually Bedford itself, is it? No, it's not. It's just pointing to it. So in the same way, signs from God must point to a reality. They are not an end in themselves. So, for example, you know, in Medjugorje, lots of people say they see the miracle of the sun, or their rosaries have turned to gold, or they smell roses inexplicably, things like that. These, these are genuine signs. I've, I have to admit, I've experienced all three myself many, many times. Um, I don't even go looking for them. But if they are signs, they must point to a reality. So, you know, when people get excited and say, oh, Father, I saw the miracle of the sun, 
I say to them, well, what did it look like? It looks initially like a big white host. And so if it's a sign pointing to something, what is it telling us? It's telling us go to mass and stop looking at the sun. If your rosary turns to gold, it's telling you your rosary is priceless. It's worth more than gold. It's not saying that you have the Midas touch and that you're going to make us all rich, right? If you smell roses, you know, it means, uh, well, Our Lady is the mystical rose. It's a sign of her presence there with you, okay? But do not get hung up on signs. Look for what the sign is pointing to, the reality. This is so important. Are you happy with this so far? Okay, at least one person is happy. <laughs> okay. The rest of you, I'm sorry. Now, having told you all this, this is the context of what I want to say next, because I first went to Medjugorje in 1991. I was 20 years old, I was still in the army, post-operation, and I did not go looking for signs or wonders. On my second last day in Medjugorje, I went to climb the mountain. There are two mountains in Medjugorje. There's the, the smaller one called Apparition Hill, Port Bordeaux, and then there's the bigger one, three times as high, called Cross Mountain, Krijevats. Okay, I went to climb the taller one, Cross Mountain, and it was the 11th of September, 1991, and we, I went with my friend Kevin. Kevin is a year younger than I am, and we went at four in the morning, and as we walked to the mountain, a light appeared on the mountain where the cross is. It was orange golden and beautiful and very bright. And we prayed the rosary as we walked, wondering what this thing was on the mountain. And when we got close enough, we saw, we saw what it was, and it stunned us into silence. And we didn't talk about it to anyone for a while, a good while, maybe even years. We only spoke about it between ourselves. The light was in the shape of a young girl. Yeah, there's someone in the front row, a bit like that, petite. And she wore a veil on her head, which hung straight down. You know, it didn't go drooping over her shoulders. And she wore a very simple dress, much simpler than my habit. And she held her hands like this with the palms on either side, with the palms facing forward. And she, her hands, her face, her clothes were all made of this orange golden light. And she was beautiful. And she was looking at us and she was filled with love for us. We could feel that love. I think I, I was certainly in tears. I didn't look at Kevin, you know, two teenage boys and crying, you're not gonna look at each other. Um, I assume he was, he was blubbing. He's never admitted to it. <laughs> then we climbed the mountain, hoping to catch her at the top. And three quarters of the way up, we looked out, and on the left, you could see the lower hill, Apparition Hill. Today, there is a statue that marks the spot where Our Lady first appeared. In those days, it was a bare patch of ground with a wooden cross, and the same young girl was standing there on the same spot with her hands in the same position, but this time facing the church and the village. And at the top of the mountain, we found a couple from, Flo uh, from Tallahassee, and they had seen nothing. I remember in my diary at the time, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, I wrote down elderly couple from Florida. They were in their early 60s, I think. But <laughs> anyway, so they had seen nothing. We didn't tell them what we had seen. We had no desire to talk about this because it kind of imposed a silence on us. Kevin had his zoom lens and high-speed film and all that, but something kind of told us, don't take a picture, do, do not cheapen this. So we didn't. And after that, we went down the mount mountain and we went to the church and the first mass had just finished. So it was about half past seven in the morning and there were just three of us in the church. Kevin was taking pictures of all the stained glass windows. Father Petr Lubicic, who's one of the Franciscans, was watching him, wondering what's this strange Chinese dude up to. And I was, okay, in Medjugorje in the church, the statue of Our Lady is on that side, where St. Joseph is. And I was almost towards the back, near pillar number four. And I was standing there looking at the statue, and I was thinking, what is this all about? 
uh, did I imagine this? No, but then Kevin saw it as well. Am I crazy? Uh, who was that? And what did it mean? And while I was thinking these thoughts over and over again, the second half happened, which was a voice speaking inside me. Now, before I continue, we must remember what St. Teresa of Avila tells us, her good advice. She says, voices inside us come from either God or the devil or our imagination. Okay? So while I will swear on the Gospels until I die that on the 11th of September, 1991, from 4 till 6 in the morning, I saw on Cross Mountain in, in Medjugorje, I saw a beautiful young girl made of orange golden light. I will swear to that. But the voice inside me, I couldn't swear to it because it could be from God, could be from the devil, could be my imagination. My friends who know me know that I have a hopeless imagination. I'm very lousy at picking Christmas gifts. You know, if you got another pair of socks, yeah, that was me, sorry. Um, and as for the devil, I don't think he would have said such good things. Now the voice, it was a woman's voice, a very beautiful voice, and she spoke in English. And um, people often ask me, what kind of accent did she have? I am not aware of her having an accent at all, but you have to understand, I'm not aware that I have an accent, you know? Because <laughs> all around the States, when I go speaking, people say to me, you have an accent? You know, sorry, I, I can only do a Southern accent, I'm sorry. <laughs> You have an accent, okay. Sorry, I apologize, that's a terrible American accent. And um, I always think, I haven't got an accent. You do, you know, I'm, I'm kind of neutral. This is neutral, anyway. So I'm not conscious of her having an accent. She just spoke. It was a beautiful voice. And this woman began by telling me my whole life story back to me. First of all, she was far more positive than I would have been. And secondly, she told me every single unconfessed sin that I had. And she didn't just tell me my sins, she also told me my motivation behind them. Now she did this very kindly and charitably, very gently. So it was not humiliating, but it was strange. It was cathartic, but it was also strange. Because you're kind of listening back to your life from a completely different perspective. Um, and when she finished, it took a long while, actually, it took a long while. These days, it would take ages. We'd be there forever. It'd take a few days. But when she finished, she stopped and she said, you are happy because you've seen me. And I said, yes, I'm very happy. Who are you? And she said, sorry, when she said, because you've seen me, I realized, I thought, aha, it's the young girl on the mountain, okay? And when I asked her who she was, she said, I am your mother, the mother of God. I want you to tell everyone you meet that I am their mother and that I love them. Now, I must explain that when she spoke, she made you feel exactly what she meant. So when she said that I am their mother, she really meant like she had physically given birth to every single one of you, every single one of us. Like we had cost her something, like she was claiming us for herself. When she said, and that I love them, it's like she hugged my soul to show me how she loves you. And I'm going to try and describe that. Our Lady looks at you, first of all, like you're the only child she has, like you're the only person in the whole universe. She looks at you like you are utterly wonderful and beautiful and gorgeous and marvelous and fantastic. She looks at you like you're amazing. This is how she looks at you. I remember this clearly because I was thinking, I'm not marvelous, but it's useless. You cannot fight her. You just have to accept that this is how she loves you. She loves you like you are utterly wonderful. Then she said, do not begin to imagine you deserve to see me. God gives grace as he chooses. Okay, so right at the beginning she said, don't worry about this, you don't deserve it. Okay. And then I, because I wanted to see her again, I thought, how can I arrange that? So I said, Blessed Mother, I'm very happy to have seen you. I'd very much like to die now, please. And I, I was, it came from the heart, you know, because I thought it would be fantastic. I could drop dead in church and go with her because she's so beautiful. You know, why waste time getting old, right? And she said, would you not like to live a bit longer to help me? 
Now, when she said a bit longer, she made it clear she meant anything from nine days to 90 years. But the part when she said to help me, she never explained that because she never ever talked about a vocation or the priesthood to me, nothing about that. Now, I don't think I was being given a real choice, but because I was young and dumb, younger and dumber than I am today, I thought it was like I had to make a decision. So I delayed and I ummed and ahmed, and finally I said to her, all right then, but you'd better make sure it's worth my while. <laughs> now, when I said that, I mean, honestly, I wasn't trying to be cheeky, but I, I spoke from anguish of heart because I really wanted to go with her. So when I said that, she laughed, and she had a beautiful laugh, in case you're going to ask. And after she laughed, I realized I shouldn't have said that, okay? And then she took control of the whole conversation like a mother with an idiotic child, you know? You know when your children embarrass you in public and you think, oh, who, you know, who spawned you? Shut up, you know, that kind of thing. Well, anyway, she took control of the whole conversation after that point. And then she said to me, the day will come when you will regret ever having seen me. And I said, this is the best day of my life. How can you say that? And she said, the day will come when you will deny ever having seen me. Now, I have to admit, even at that time, I was conscious. I was thinking, this sounds like the prediction of Peter's denial, right? So, you know, remember, a good rule of thumb is quit while you're behind, right? Quit while you're behind. <laughs> so I thought, don't protest. Don't make too much of a fuss. And all of this came true, just as she said. Because within five years of this, I was at medical school in England. Uh, and in case you ask, yes, I finished medical school, became a doctor, blah, 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 and then joined the order, okay? Uh, it's all boring stuff, so I won't get into that. I was at medical school, and I said to her, I wish I had never seen you, mostly because I felt it like such a burden. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm like a freak. I can never tell anyone this. No one would believe me. And um, also, I had not done anything that she had asked me to do. So I felt it as such a burden, I, so I said that to her. And then also, in England, lots of people make fun of Medjugorje. Instead of saying Medjugorje, they say mega forgery, okay? And I, because I was a Judas and a coward, I used to laugh with them and not tell them the truth about what I had seen and experienced and what I actually believed. She then said that when I, she said, when you turn again, you must hold firm to Christ. Okay? And again, the language is a bit like the Gospels, turning again. But she said, hold firm to Christ. She never said, hold firm to Medjugorje. She just said, hold firm to Christ. And then she asked me if I was willing to suffer. I said, yes. And she told me where my greatest suffering would come from. And she showed me the only thing about the future I remember. Actually, she showed me lots of stuff about the future. I remember almost all of them made, made me utterly delighted and amazed, but she told me I would forget, and I said, no, I won't forget, and then I forgot immediately after the conversation. But the one thing I remember that she showed me was this, that a time is coming with respect to 1991 when almost every Catholic in the world will be ashamed of the words of Jesus. They will be ashamed of Jesus and his words. And they will say things like, we don't remember him saying that, or that doesn't apply to us, we're far too modern and sophisticated or ad advanced. You know, things like that. They will kind of turn their backs on Jesus. And actually, it is a really horrible, horrible thing, what she showed me. It frightened me so much, because very, very few Catholics will remain faithful. Very few. And those who do will be persecuted terribly by other Catholics. Okay, so when she showed me this, I said the first thing that came to mind. I said, I said, Blessed Mother, could you please make sure that my parents die before this happens? Okay, I don't know why I prayed for that, but it was the first thing that came to my mind. I thought I didn't want them to suffer through such, it was horrible, it was really horrible. And so those of you recording me, please don't tell my parents. They don't know about this, okay? They will not be happy, I think. You have to try and imagine Indian parents, you know? 
You saw the mother of God, you prayed for us to die. What kind of son are you? <laughs> okay, actually, my parents don't sound like that, but I'm, my Indian accent is quite lousy as well, so I... <laughs> anyway, so they won't be pleased, um, I imagine. But anyway, that is the one thing I remember that she showed me. And then I told her all of my problems, and she told me to give my heart to Jesus, to pray with a firm faith, and to surrender my life to Jesus. That's how she said it. It was not the answer I wanted, but it is the answer that I need. And the same applies to all of us. She said, give your heart to Jesus, pray with a firm faith, surrender your life to Jesus. Okay? And then after that, she, she told me, you will never enjoy the support of your own, but you will never lack friends among those with a real devotion to me. Okay? This is a kind of a prophecy, I guess, because it's, or maybe a litmus test is what I mean, because I, I still keep seeing this every day, now, being fulfilled. And what she said was true. It is true. And also, it's, it's related to something else she said to me about are you willing to suffer? It's related to those things. Anyway, after that, she said, she told me not to go looking for her. I would not see her again if I did, but that she would come for me when I'm dying. And then the conversation finished. It felt like we spoke for at least four glorious hours, four happy, glorious hours. On my watch, it was 20 minutes. So I guess it's a bit like Narnia. You know, time must move differently or something. And that was it. That's how it came to an end. Now, I do not ask any of you to believe this. Even if you did believe this, this is not proof that Medjugorje is real. Okay? And also, you know, maybe, maybe I might be mad. Maybe I'm lying. I don't know. I mean, I know, but you don't know <laughs> for sure. Okay? I don't ask anyone to believe me at all. Because I'm not important. I'm not a visionary. I'm not special. I ask you to believe one thing, though. I ask you to believe that Our Lady loves you. She looks at you like you are utterly, utterly gorgeous and marvelous, beautiful. And this is how she loves you. You must believe this, because if you are paying attention, this is the only reason I'm telling this story. Because she said, tell everyone you meet that I am their mother and that I love them. Okay? So will you believe that, at least, that Our Lady loves you? Okay, half-hearted yes. <laughs> okay. Now, please believe it. You must believe it. Because if Our Lady loves us like this, how must God love us? God must be passionately, madly in love with us. And really, everything begins from this. When we know how we are loved, we want to respond to that love and be converted. Which brings me now to what I really want to talk about, which is the heart of Our Lady's messages in Medjugorje, and they are known as the Five Stones. Five Stones. They're called Five Stones because of David the Shepherd Boy. Remember, he goes to meet Goliath, and he takes with him a sling and five stones, five pebbles from the stream. So these are weapons that Our Lady gives us, and they are weapons to aid our conversion. She comes, she says, I, c I have come to tell you that God exists and she, that we must be converted. This is why she comes. So, the first stone is pray with the heart. Pray with the heart. Now, in Croatian, it's just two words, molite srcem. It means pray by means of the heart, pray through the heart, pray from the heart, pray and mean your prayers. Okay, what does she mean by this? I want you to imagine, you know, when we apologize, when we use the word sorry, how we misuse the word sorry. In England, we are masters of passive aggression. So, you know, if someone bumps into me or steps on my foot, I will turn to them and say, sorry, meaning, get off my foot, you idiot. Yes? Okay. And were people apologizing to you the last time you were in England? They, were probably, they probably meant it in an aggressive way. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Or think about politicians getting caught, getting up to um, hanky-panky or 
fiddling the books. And then they say things like, I'm sorry for the distress this has caused the people I represent and to my family. Meaning, I'm sorry I got caught. I should have been allowed to get away with my fun, right? Okay, is that a bit cynical about politicians? All right. Now, what happens when a small kid says sorry? Well, usually they start crying. Why do they cry? Because they actually mean what they're saying. They haven't become jaded and cynical like the rest of us. They still mean what they say. This is what Our Lady means by pray with the heart. Pray and mean your prayers. Now, do you have distractions when you pray? Anyone? Yes, a few people nodding. Okay. I, I want to suggest to you that we have distractions because we're not praying from the heart. We're telling God what we think He wants to hear rather than what we really want to tell Him. So we end up praying for world peace rather than saying, could I have a nicer job because my boss is mean to me and I hate it there, you know? We should pray from the heart for what we really want. We should tell him the truth in there because he already knows it, he can see it. Imagine a typical scenario. You're in church early, waiting for mass, preparing for mass. Then a gentleman comes along, an older gentleman. He kneels in the pew in front of you and he starts praying the rosary. And you think, how marvelous, how edifying to see that. That's lovely. But the problem is he, his dentures are loose, right? And they're making this clicking sound as he prays. And you think, oh, for heaven's sake, how can I concentrate with this going on, right? Okay. The next minute, a young girl, a young lass, comes and sits next to you. It's summertime. She has sacrificed herself because of the cotton famine that year. <laughs> and you're thinking, I don't know where to look, you know? Too much ham, not enough wrapping, right? <laughs> then, the next minute, your neighbor walks through the church front door, and you see her, and you think, oh, that witch, how dare she enter the house of God, that hypocrite, how come the Lord has not struck her dead where she stands? Okay, you know it's true, you know it's true. <laughs> and then Father comes out of the sacristy to begin Mass, and you think, oh no, it's Father Leon, he's going to go on and on and on for ages. <laughs> and finally you think, oh, I can't remember if I locked my front door and I think I left the oven on, right? And you sit there for the rest of Mass worrying about that. Okay, we need to turn all our distractions into prayer. Say, Lord, please help this gentleman find a good dentist. <laughs> please help this young lass learn the virtue of modesty, show her the kind of guy she's attracting is a jerk, and more importantly, her female friends that she dresses for have heads filled with guacamole. Okay? I know it's harsh but fair, it's true. Okay? I mean, true, right? I mean, if your friends are like Kardashians, they might have heads filled with guacamole. Okay, then, where are we? Uh, third one, your, your neighbor, the witch. Say, Lord, convert her, convert me. Bless both of us. Father Leon, please help him to be concise and on time for once. And finally, your house and the oven. Say, Jesus, send your guardian angels. Please guard my front door and turn off the oven. Amen. Okay? We need to turn all our distractions into prayer. And then you will start to pray properly. Because most often what happens, you know, we sit there on a Sunday thinking about what we have to do on a Monday. Rather than telling God, we sit there wondering about it ourselves. Okay? We need to pray from the heart. But Our Lady says something quite strange. She says, pray the rosary from the heart. Pray the rosary. What is the rosary? I'm going to tell you a quick story. When I was a kid, when I was a child, my parents went out for the evening and they left us to mind ourselves. So we got bored and we took down all the old photo albums, you know, black and white pictures, like my grandparents' wedding, that kind of stuff. And we were looking through all these, rifling through all of them, thinking, Look, it's our family, but how come we're not in these pictures? You know, and when you're children, you have a, a real sense of, we have to set this right. So we got a big orange crayon. Yes. And we drew ourselves in. You know, so my mother's baptism, I remember, you know, looming over the cradle is a gigantic stick figure version of my sister <laughs> with a big crazy grin on her face. My parents' wedding, all four of us are in the front row waving, <laughs> you know. We made it. We were here. <laughs> okay. Now, despite the trouble we got into, what we did 
has so much in common with medieval uh, Renaissance Italian art. <laughs> okay. I don't mean it was a masterpiece. It wasn't a masterpiece. What I mean is, think about uh, Italian Renaissance art. What do you get? You know, you have the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, Our Lady and St. Joseph adoring Jesus, shepherds, angels singing Gloria and Excelsis, wise men bringing gifts, and Don Cosimo and his wife, Donna Lucrezia. And you think, what are they doing there, right? It's their orange crayon. They, they could afford Michelangelo to paint them in. This is what the rosary is. The rosary is your orange crayon to draw yourself into the mysteries of Christ's life. Because Jesus and Mary are our family, we should say, how come I wasn't there when such and such happened to them? So we put ourselves in through the rosary. But more than that, the rosary is a time machine, a time machine. I mean this quite literally, because when you pray the third joyful mystery, for example, the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem, you're not just trying to imagine the first Christmas. The power of the first Christmas, the original Christmas, comes to you today, now, as you pray the third joyful mystery, and so on with all the mysteries of the rosary. So in this sense, it is truly a time machine, okay? But the rosary is powerful. During exorcisms, the demons say, we hate that thing. They call it, they use a word I can't use. They say, we hate that poo, meaning the rosary. And then they say, but thankfully, most priests today do not promote it. Now, every Hail Mary you say devoutly from your heart is a hammer blow to Satan's pride, to his head. And every rosary you say devoutly is a chain that binds the demons and weakens their power on this earth. Okay, so the rosary is powerful. In Medjugorje, what happened was, initially, uh, the people were praying, you know, after the apparition started, they prayed seven Our Father, seven Hail Mary, seven Glory Bees, just as a thanksgiving. And Our Lady then said, could you please add the Apostles' Creed? So they did. And they still do that today, after the evening Mass, Apostles' Creed, then seven Our Fathers, seven Hail Mary, seven Glory Bees. Then, after a few months, she said, I'd like you to pray five decades of the rosary, you know, so one third of the rosary, either joyful or sorrowful or glorious mysteries. So they did that every day. And then a few months after that, she said, thank you very much, marvelous. Could you please pray the complete rosary, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries? And when she said this, the villagers were up in arms. And they said, what? That's impossible. We're so busy. This takes up so much time. And she said, you do not understand how little time this takes up of your day. What does she mean by that? Well, if you pray the rosary properly, it takes about 15 minutes to pray five decades. I say 15 minutes as a kind of a guide, a gauge. It should be minimum 15 minutes. If, you, if you're praying it in less than 15 minutes, you're probably praying it too fast, okay? Because I remember this, in Singapore, we used to gabble through the rosary at Irish speed. If you've ever been to Ireland and prayed the rosary with them, you'll know what I mean, yes? Okay, and I remember we had a Buddhist friend, there's a Buddhist friend, and he said, you Catholics, you're so weird. What's so blessed about a monk swimming? And we were all scratching our heads thinking, what is he talking about? What's he on about? And it's only when we started praying the rosary, it became clear. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou, monk swimming. Okay? <laughs> so slow down, slow down. It should take at least 15 minutes. But ask yourself, if you think it's too much time, you know, if you, the whole rosary is 45 minutes out of your day. If you think that's too much time, ask yourself, how many 15-minute slots of your time have you wasted on Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, eBay, Amazon, Days of Our Lives, Love Island? Or those of you who've watched the movie Titanic, that's three and a half hours of your life completely wasted, <laughs> right? It's gone, you know, because at the end, you know, Kate Winslet shoves Leonardo off the thingamy and he falls down and he drowns, right? And she kills him because any doctor can tell you, you know, if you have hypothermia, the rule is you're not dead till you're warm and dead. So he, he was probably still alive when she shoved him off and killed him. 
what a waste, what a waste of time. Three and a half hours wasted, right? Okay. I've never watched it, actually. But I know what happened. <laughs> but I do know what happens. It's basically fornication on the high seas, followed with mur by murder. And then she turns into an old woman. Okay. So don't waste your time. Fifteen minutes, it all, it's all it takes. But Our Lady asks us, I can't water down her words. She says, pray the whole rosary, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious. You know, the complete rosary, this one. Uh, the one that she gave to St. Dominic, the founder of my order. Don't ask me about Luminous. They were not invented when she said this, okay? So that's the first stone. I will get quicker, don't worry. The second stone is Holy Mass. And I said earlier I'm going to talk about Mass. Holy Mass. What is Mass? Well, Mass is clearly not what I said it's not earlier. Remember, I said we tell our kids it's a party and a gathering of friends. Tell them all this rubbish. It's not. Tell them the truth. What is Mass? There's a clue. Look up. What do you see up there? Mass is something that takes place in heaven. Read the letter to the Hebrews and the book of Revelation, where Christ enters the sanctuary not made by human hands and offers his body and blood to the Father in the Spirit. And he's surrounded by angels and saints who adore him and worship and cast their crowns before him. They're holding crowns here as well cast their crowns before him, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of armies. This is what Mass is. And we have clues to this in the Mass. Think about just before the Sanctus, before the Holy, holy, we say, you know, with the angels and archangels, uh, powers and dominions, we too join in their unending hymn as we acclaim. So we're saying we're joining in what's going on in heaven. And also the first Eucharistic prayer, the Roman canon, we say, May your angel take the sacrifice to your altar in heaven. Then as we receive from this altar the most sacred body and blood of your Son, let us be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Who is the angel taking the sacrifice up? It's Jesus, actually. Not that Jesus is an angel. It's just an ancient Christian way of referring to Jesus, the messenger who connects heaven and earth. So the Mass is worship in heaven that we plug into and join. What, uh, sometimes people say, you know, I, I don't get much out of Mass. Why should I bother? You know, whatever. Okay, let's think about other things that we don't get much out of. For example, I don't get much out of celebrating my mother's birthday. Okay? Because all her bingo pals come round, and they all make cake, and they force feed me cake, and then they do the typical Indian thing. You are so fat now, you know? <laughs> I was like, and like, I've had enough of this abuse, you know, a whole lifetime of this. So I've decided from this year onwards, I'm not going to celebrate my mother's birthday anymore. Okay? Because, you know, why should I be abused like that, right? I have to stand up for myself. Don't you agree? Okay. And I don't get anything out of it, celebrating my mother's birthday. Now, if you have any sense, and I'm sure all of you do, because you're looking at me like, oh, you awful priest, I don't like you now. But by the way, the story is fake, all right? <laughs> she, my mother doesn't have bingo pals. But the force feeding cake, that's true. That part is true. Um, you would say to me something like, Father, your mother's birthday is about her, not about you. It's not about what you get out of it. It's about your mother, right? Okay. When someone says to you, I don't get much out of Mass, you tell them the truth. It's not about you. Who says it's about you and what you get out of it? It's about what you've come to give Jesus. What have you come to bring him? Because he's expecting you, body and soul, completely. And we have to offer ourselves to him. At the offertory, when the priest offers up the bread and wine, we put ourselves there as well, mystically, body and soul, to be offered up to the Father in the Holy Spirit. So the Mass is not about what we get out of it. It's about what we've come to give Jesus, to give God. Okay? So Holy Mass is special. Our Lady says... Go to Mass early. Prepare with silence before Mass. She also says, let the priest prepare with silence in the sacristy. Never leave Mass without making your thanksgiving. Understand the importance of the Mass. And then she says, to those who come habitually late to Mass, it would be better for them not to go, go at all. Okay? Now, that's what she actually said. I know it sounds very harsh, but that's what she said. 
And I noticed she said habitually late. Because I guess if you're habitually late, you're really saying to God, I can't be that bothered about you. Okay. So Mass is special. Mass is beautiful. I have a friend, I have a classmate who is a martyr, Father Ragid Ghani um, from Iraq. And he studied with us at the Angelicum. And he went back to Iraq and he was threatened. This is back in 2006, he went back. In 2007, he was threatened by Al-Qaeda, as they were known then, ISIS today. And they told him, stop celebrating Mass. But he carried on celebrating Mass. And then one day, they caught him outside the church after Mass. And they said, priest, we told you to stop celebrating Mass. And he said the truth. He said, without the Mass, we cannot live. And when he did this, he was quoting the early Christian martyrs, the Silitan martyrs. They said to the Roman authorities, Sine Dominica, non possumus. Without the Mass, we cannot live. And it's true. We, without the Mass, we can't live. And then they shot him and killed him, and three deacons with him. Father Ragid and the deacons are martyrs, and their cause is coming up before Pope Francis. But remember, in Iraq, Catholics are dying for the Mass. We have to treasure the Mass while we can. Okay? The Mass is beautiful. Okay. Now I'm going to get even quicker. The third stone is Holy Bible. Holy Bible. Our Lady says, put the Bible in a prominent place in the family house. Let everyone read it, including the children. Read especially the Gospels. Read it in the morning. Root it in your heart and live by it, especially when things are difficult. And by evening, you will be stronger than evil. Okay? Now, would you believe someone if they said to you, I love you, but I don't want to know anything about you. You know, shut up, don't tell me anything. Just let me love you. Ladies, would you believe someone courting you if they said that? I know, I'm deliberately old-fashioned. I don't like dating and words like that. Courting, wooing, that, uh, that's a proper way. Anyway, would you believe them? No, you wouldn't. Would you say, welcome to Dumpsville, population you? Yes, you should. <laughs> Get rid of them. Get rid of them. You don't need that kind of nonsense. Right? St. Jerome says, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. Can Jesus believe us when we say we love you, Jesus, if we never read his book? Should he believe us? Okay. Now, I was in the Bible Belt in North Carolina, and I was saying to them, you need to know the Bible better than Protestants. Okay? Because, I mean, Protestants... They have a, a mutilated Bible, thanks to Martin Luther and his insanity, right? He chopped out seven books and parts of two other books, you know? Well, anyway, <laughs> we have the complete scriptures. We need to read them and treasure them. You know, this, this is a true story. I was back in my monastery in London, and a friend of mine, a Protestant, he was coming for lunch at the monastery. And he was a bit early, and I was having a shower upstairs. And he texted me and said, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12 or something. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice, I will enter and I will dine with him. So I get the text and I think, oh, you smug so-and-so, you know? So I thought, I'm, I'm going to show him Catholics know the scriptures just as well. So I texted back, Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. Behold, I heard the sound of thy voice in the garden, but I was naked and afraid and hid myself. <laughs> It is true. It's a true story. <laughs> we need to know the Bible better. Not, not to compete with Protestants, but because it's our book. And we need to read it and live by it. Read the Gospels especially. Now, there is something, um, maybe you're encountering this more and more in the States, but you know, priests from Kerala, Kerala is southwest India, where my ancestors are ultimately from. And most priests there tend to be charismatics. Have you noticed that? Charismatics? Okay, anyway. One of the things they do is they use the scriptures to heal people. You know, they read out the Gospels over people, and lots of people get cured. This is not a surprise. The Word of God has the power to heal. You could be healed through the Eucharist. You could be healed through hearing the scriptures, because it is the Word of God. Okay? So remember that. The Word of God has this power. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not just talking about healing. It has the power to heal our souls, change us also. Okay? 
The fourth stone is fasting, fasting. Our Lady says, fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. The best fast is on bread and water. With fasting, you can stop physical laws and suspend wars, okay? Now, why Wednesday and Friday? Well, Wednesday is the day in tradition that Judas went to the high priest and said, what will you give me if I hand him over to you? The day of the betrayal. Friday is the day of our Lord's passion and death. Actually, there's a memory. This is an ancient fast. This is an ancient, ancient fast. There's a memory of this preserved in some European languages. For example, in Irish, the word for Wednesday is Jekadin, which means day of the first fast. And Friday is Jehinia, the day of the big fast, the day of the principal fast. And Thursday, Jayardin, which means day between the two fasts. Okay, today's Thursday. Thank God it's Thursday. You can eat today. <laughs> All right. Okay, so there's a memory of this preserved in many European languages and cultures. And we've kind of forgotten this. This fasting on Wednesday and Friday is a fast that Our Lady herself did. We know this. There's a document called the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, which was written maybe as early as A.D. 50, so about 20 years after the resurrection. And it says there clearly, it says, you shall fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay? So it's a fast Our Lady herself kept. To this day, all the Eastern Orthodox and all the Eastern Catholics fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. It's only us in the West, Latin Catholics. That's what we are, Latin Catholics. We are a bit hopeless at fasting. We have two days of fasting left, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And even that we say, oh, you can have one full meal and then you can have two small meals added together, which doesn't add up to one full meal. We call this fasting, right? My Jewish friend said to me, you Catholics, when you say fasting, you mean you don't eat in between meals. <laughs> okay. And he's right, it's true. It's true. Now, fasting is powerful. Gee, why should we fast? Jesus expects, us, expects that we will fast. He says, when the bridegroom is taken away, then my disciples will fast. He doesn't say my disciples will know how to spell the word fast. He says my disciples will fast. And he also says some kind of demons cannot come out except through prayer and fasting. What kind of demons? Especially the addictive ones. Alcohol, gambling, drugs, pornography. These kind of demons latch onto the soul um, and are tenacious. And to get rid of them, we need prayer and fasting to be free be utterly free to follow Jesus, okay? But all of us need to fast. Our Lady doesn't force us to fast, but she invites us. Having said that, she's quite strict about this. She says, no one is excused from fasting, not even the elderly. Only the sick are excused. And then she says, but for the sick, let him who's, who, they know what they must give up. Let him who smokes give up cigarettes. Let him who drinks stop drinking alcohol. Let him who watches television turn off the TV. She gives three examples what the sick could do. So I think, I mean, and she's quite strict about TV, actually. She says, if you watch television, you have no peace in you, and then you are unable to pray. And if she said that about television in the 1980s, you know, I mean, what did we have? It was all harmless stuff, right? A-Team, uh, MacGyver, you know, with a toothbrush and whatever, he makes a bomb or a plane or something. I mean, it's all kind of harmless stuff, even Magnum PI. And now, what would she say about television and the internet now? Good Lord. I, yeah, she'd say turn it off and throw it away, I think. I imagine. But she says we need to be able to pray. And now, when we fast, we are saying, Jesus, I love you more than these other things, you know? So, for example, Lent has just started yesterday, you know, unless you eat a pound of chocolate every day for your, in your whole life, giving up chocolate for Lent is not a big sacrifice. Is it? I don't think it's a big sacrifice. And also, you know, sometimes, I, I've done this myself, you know, sometimes uh, misled pastors will say things like, you know, rather than giving up something, it's more important you take on something positive. You can take on something positive any time, but Lent is about giving up, making a sacrifice. There's power in making a sacrifice. Because you're saying to Jesus, 
I love you more than Instagram and Facebook and days of our lives. I love you more than my cell phone. I love you more than TV. I love you more than Netflix. I love you more than booze. I love you more than gambling. I love you more than these other things. That's what we're doing. And when we do that, there is great power. You know? I always think of, you know, when people say, I've given up, given up chocolate for Lent, I always say, I've given up champagne and caviar for Lent. <laughs> you know, it's a big hardship for me. Okay, no. <laughs> no. Okay, our sacrifice must be one that really makes a difference, that really hurts us to an extent. And then it's a proper sacrifice. Okay. But fasting is powerful. I encourage you, pray for the grace to be able to fast, and then just do it. If you're, look, if you're diabetic, you know, don't go fasting, and then you, know, you get into a diabetic coma and say, oh, you know, that little brown dude dressed as a Ku Klux Klansman told me to fast. You know, don't blame me about, for this, all right? <laughs> okay. Be sensible. But pray for the grace to fast, and then do it. Now, people often ask me, how long on Wednesday, how long on Friday? The whole day, 24 hours. So long as it's Wednesday, so long as it's Friday. And then they say, oh, Father, can I have bread with olives on it and a sprinkling of cinnamon and sugar and whatever? Look, bread, which is bread, not cake, okay? <laughs> and then what kind of water? Water, which is water, not gin or vodka, <laughs> okay? H2O, two molecules of hydrogen, one of oxygen, bonded in a covalent bond, and the, then the molecules bonded to each other with weak van der Waals forces, right? Water. <laughs> okay. But, you know, and then sometimes people say, Father, I can't eat any bread. What can I do? I say, congratulations, just have water. It's much easier. You don't have to think. All right. But honestly, pray for the grace and just do it. You honestly, all of you are able, all, all of you are able to do this. Uh, it's the mental hurdle is the bigger one, not the physical one. The physical hurdle is nothing. You'll get over it after the, after the first two years, no, after, the, after the first two weeks. <laughs> okay. Now, the last stone, last but not least, is confession. Our Lady says, the West has forgotten the power of confession. If people in the West went to confession once a month, whole regions of the West would be converted. Go to confession and make a simple, humble, and complete confession of all your sins. And then she said again, go to confession at least once a month. Now, I think of confession as doing my laundry. How often do you wash your clothes? Every Easter and Christmas tide? You only wash your clothes at your first Holy Communion and you haven't bothered since? Every three years? Every seven years? What am I bid? Okay, right, look, if we don't go to confession regularly, everyone here is going to know. I mean, sorry, if we don't wash our clothes regularly, ev everyone here is going to know, right? We'll be in one corner, and everyone else will be in the other corner clutching their smelling salts, right? And trying not to gag and puke, right? Okay. If we don't go to confession regularly, the angels will be trying not to gag and puke. They tell a story of St. Catherine of Siena, that great saint of my order. This very pompous, arrogant, proud person went to see her. And for the whole interview, Catherine turned away 90 degrees like this. And she spoke to the person like this. And only when they left, she turned back. And Catherine's friends said, why did you do that? That's pretty strange. And she said, couldn't you smell the stench? The stench of the person's soul. Okay, so we need to go and confess. Now, how do we confess our sins? To make a good confession, to make a good confession, remember this simple mnemonic. Three words. Confess your sins, period. Confess your sins, okay? And by emphasizing each word, you'll know how to confess. First word, confess. It must be a confession. If you go to the priest and say, maybe I did this, maybe I did that, then the priest is thinking, maybe I absolve you, maybe I don't. Right? Okay. Second word, confess your sins. They must be yours. Father, I get so mad. My husband makes me so furious. I have no peace. He's such an idiot. Still, he's not as bad as my daughter-in-law. Oh, she's awful. I hate her. And I don't like how she's raising my grandkids. 
Still, she's a saint compared to my pastor. Oh, the new one, he's terrible. He's doing all these old-fashioned things. I can't stand it. Okay. If you want to confess other people's sins, I'm happy to absolve them. They'll be okay. You can go to hell, but your family will be all right. Okay. Remember, confess your sins. Life is too short. Just confess your own sins. Then third word, confess your sins. They must be sins. Do not confess feelings, emotions, sentiments. Father, my brother is a drug addict. He wanted money. I didn't give him anything. Well, I think he did the right thing. I still feel so bad, though. Well, you did the right thing. I feel so bad, though. Well, you need therapy. <laughs> Look, do not confess your feelings. Confession is not therapy. Just confess your sins. Remember, remember to be humble. You know, don't come in and tell the priest how fantastic you are. Father, I'm amazing. I'm marvelous. I haven't killed anyone. <laughs> when people do that, I always think, I want to canonize you now. I want right now. <laughs> and by canonize, I mean I want to put you in a cannon and launch you <laughs> far away. Okay? So don't do that. Don't do that. And also resist the temptation. I mean, think about who, who does that in the Gospels? The Pharisee. I thank thee, Lord, that I'm not like other men, not even like this sinner here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes on all I own and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, don't come boasting about how wonderful you are, okay? Be humble before God. I don't mean the priest, before God. Now, resist the temptation to tell stories. I say this on behalf of every priest throughout the whole world. Resist the temptation to tell stories. Father, last Tuesday, no, I tell a lie. It was Wednesday, I remember, because that Wednesday is bingo night and we have Wheel of Fortune. I, the doorbell rang, I went to look through the peephole, and it was my friend Betty. And I had such a fright, so I ran out through the back door, I put on my brown shoes, not my black ones, and I leapt over the hedge behind the house into the alleyway, and I was trying to run away from Betty, but she nipped round and she caught me. And Betty said, oh, Mildred, you're wearing your brown shoes, not your black ones. When you tell stories like this, or like any story, I mean, here, like, what is the priest supposed to think? You're confessing a fashion faux pas, what? <laughs> Just confess your sins. Do not tell stories, okay? And every priest will, in the whole world will thank me. <laughs> then, I never get tired hearing confessions. In Medjugorje, you know, you, you end up hearing confessions for like six hours sometimes. I never get tired of confessions, but stories are draining, absolutely draining. Okay. And last of all, but not least, I want you to remember confession is not just the forgiveness of sins. It's a sacrament, which means God is giving us grace to change us. So think of, think of confession as like, a, like an ATM machine that's malfunctioning and churning out all this cash. And you can take as much as you can carry. It's legal. You can take as much as you can carry. How often would you go? At Christmas and Eastertide? Or you just go at your first Holy Communion and then not bother going after that? How often would you go? Who would go every day? Okay, a few honest people. The rest of you are liars. <laughs> Those who did not put up your hands. We, you know all of us would be there every day. Every single day, right? And we would, we would bring our family and friends with us, forming a big line. Come on, come on, fill it up, you know, all our plastic bags. Okay. I said that for a reason. You can carry, you can take as much as you can carry. God gives us grace to the extent that we are contrite. Remember, contrition is not about beating your breast and saying, I'm so awful, I'm terrible. Contrition is being sorry for our sins, moved by the love of God, because God loves us so much and we turned away from Him. So it's trust in divine mercy. That's what contrition is. Okay, so to that extent, God gives us grace. So, you know, the, the more arrogant and proud we are, the more self-sufficient I'm, I'm okay, Father. I'm good. I haven't killed anyone. That kind of person doesn't get much grace. It's very sad. But the humbler they are, I, I'll tell you the truth, and I'm sure every priest will agree with me, when we hear a humble confession, we always think, this person is so holy. I always think this person is holier than me. 
Whereas when someone comes in boasting about how wonderful they are, I always think, where's my cannon? I need my cannon, right? And to launch them again. So, and also don't be worried about what the priest thinks of you. We never ever remember your sins. I never remember. I remember one incident, like I was with four friends and I was, I was saying to them, I thank God I've never heard any of your confessions. You know, because, you know, it's kind of awkward if they're your friends, you know. And, and all four of them said, yes, you have, Father. You know, I couldn't believe it. I thought, really? But I don't remember. I do not remember. I never remember. I have a terrible memory. You know, and also, I, I get this a lot in Medjugorje. People will come and say, Father, as I told you yesterday, I'm thinking, and I look at them thinking, I've never seen you in my life, you know. <laughs> And this is not just an inverse racism on my part. It's not me looking and thinking, oh, white people all look the same, you know. <laughs> this, I, I honestly do not remember. <laughs> so, anyway. So don't worry about what the priest thinks of you. Just come and confess your sins. It's between you and Jesus, the priest is there to give you God's forgiveness, okay? So these are the five stones. I'm going to recap them. Pray with the heart. Pray the rosary from the heart every day, the complete rosary. Holy Mass, treasure it. Prepare for it beforehand with silence and after with thanksgiving. Number three, Holy Bible. Let everyone in the family read it, especially the Gospels, in the morning, root it in your heart and live by it. Number four, fast Wednesdays and Fridays and make sacrifices. Remember also Our Lady said at Fatima, today more souls go to hell because not enough people pray and make sacrifices for them. So, and also in Medjugorje she says, I cannot convert people without your fasting and your sacrifices. So remember, our fasting has such power and value. You can convert lots of people. And number five, confession. Confess your sins humbly and simply and completely, trusting in God's mercy for you. And go once a month at least. Or if you need to, more often, but at least once a month. So these are the five stones of Medjugorje. They're the heart of what Our Lady is asking us to do. The reason she does this is she's trying to move us from a kind of minimalist um, religion to living for God, living a true relationship. Because how would you feel, ladies, how would you feel if your husbands said to me, Father, what's the least, the, what's the minimum we need to do for our wives to be decent husbands? Would you be impressed with that kind of question? No, you wouldn't. You know, should I buy chocolates and flowers once a year? Maybe uh, once a year grunt extra appreciatively when she cooks or something? Okay, no. We should never ask what's the minimum in a relationship. And likewise with God. We're in a relationship with God. So Our Lady is trying to move us away from the least to actually living our faith and our relationship with God. So on that note, I'm going to end, and maybe just for a few minutes, not too long, if there are any pressing questions on Medjugorje or what I've said, I will try and answer. Any questions? Yes, sir. How long has the Franciscan order been in the parish? How long has the Franciscan order been in the parish of Medjugorje? Um, at least five, six hundred years. Because that region, only the Franciscans were allowed by the Ottoman Turks. The Turks were ruling it, the Muslims. And they only allowed the Franciscans to minister there. But even then, they had to hide themselves. So they dressed in lay clothes. And all the people were taught, never call them father. Because, you know, then you're exposed as a priest, they'll be killed. So in their culture, they're used to calling priests uncle. You know, so they used to call them uncle. So that the Muslim authorities were never suspicious of who they were. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. About uh, the fasting. If you are, um, you said to fast no bread or water. Is it once a day? Or I'm not quite sure. Okay, how, how often can you eat bread and water on a fasting day? That's up to you. Entirely up to you, okay? Um, I imagine if you have three meals a day, I suppose you could eat it three times. But if you don't want to eat it, then don't. If you really think you're going to faint, then keep eating it continuously throughout the day. 
<laughs> but it's up to you. Okay? Now, I should clarify. The status of Medjugorje is that it is open for anyone to visit. Medjugorje has not been condemned, neither has it been approved, but it is open for anyone to visit. And one of the things that Holy Mother Church looks for is the presence of pilgrims coming to a place that's not yet approved. So for example, Fatima and Lourdes, when they were approved, the judgment of the bishop said one of the reasons they gave for approval is the continual presence of pilgrims coming here from the very beginning. So you know, at Fatima, if people had waited for approval, no one would have seen the, you know, the 100,000 would not have been there to see the miracle of the sun. Lords, if people had waited for approval, all the early miracles would not have happened, like the, the blind stonemason and also the, the woman who plunged her child into, the, into the, the spring. You know, those miracles would not have happened if people had waited. So you are entirely allowed to go to Medjugorje. Okay, so just want to clarify that in case someone has told you that you're not allowed to go. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, what about alleged messages which appear to contradict the faith? I know all of the messages of Medjugorje, and that is not one of the messages, okay? It often appears on the internet. I've seen it on many sites. What she said was, they, she was asked, are you the source of all graces? And she said, no, I am not the source of all graces. Okay, there's another thing also that appears on the internet from people who are opposed to Medjugorje. They say, oh, Our Lady said that all religions are equal before my son, this kind of thing. You know, this, there's a good principle of St. Thomas Aquinas we have to remember. Whatever is received is received according to the manner of the recipient, okay? So people in an apparition hear and understand things in their own limited, finite vocabulary. So for example, in Medjugorje, in that region, race, ethnicity, and religion are entirely the same thing in the minds of the people there. If you're Croat, you're Catholic. If you're Muslim, you're Bosniak. If you're Orthodox, you're Serb. It's indistingu indistinguishable for them. So this, there's a message where Our Lady is supposed to have said, all religions are equal before my, my son, something like that. And this is not true. It's the understanding of the visionary who then clarified saying, yeah, there's no difference between Serbs and Bosniaks and Croats. We're equally children of uh, Our Lady and she wants to lead us to God, to Jesus, the only savior. Okay, so again, this is I think sort of deliberate twisting and taking out of context. God is sovereign over all things. Okay? But I would not say that, that that therefore means that God wills it. God does not will the diversity of religions. Okay? We can say in his passive will, he has willed it. But then you can say in that same passive will, you can say God passively wills the destruction of, of unborn children. God passively wills the Holocaust and the killing of Jews. That's, and it sounds terrible. But, you know, people understand it in a different way. God doesn't will it but he permits it, okay? So, but God is sovereign over all things. It doesn't mean that Islam is from God or, or any other religion is from God. There's only one way to God, Jesus Christ, and the church that he established, the Catholic Church, all right? Yes. Is Mary still appearing to many of the visionaries? She appears it is reported that three of the visionaries still see her every day. The other three, one of them sees her once a month and the other two see her once a year. But yeah, three of them still claim that they see her every day. In the last a uh, year and a half, uh, Pope Francis sent a, an archbishop called Henrik Hoser. His title is Apostolic Visitator. You should look that up and see what it implies in canon law. But as Apostolic Visitator he's come, his concern is nothing to do with the authenticity or inauthenticity of the apparitions and messages. It's all to do with the pilgrims who come to Medjugorje and the pastoral care that they need. So he's there. Rome has taken uh, an active interest in Medjugorje, which is good, because people do need good pastoral care there. Okay. So the Archbishop has been living there since last, I forget now, is it July or September, but 
since maybe July. I think he came in. That's right. He came in July, St. Martha's Feast, and he's been there since then. So it's quite encouraging, actually, that he's there. It's really good. We need, we need uh, a lot of things in Medjugorje, a lot of interventions, I think. You know, I'm in, I'm in charge of the English Mass, you know, and I have to say to every priest who comes there, Father, you know, and I, I'm trying not to, be, not to sound condescending, but I have to remind them, Father, please, you know, say the black, do the red, you know, <laughs> out of the missal. Uh, because it's not obvious to priests in the English-speaking world. There's a lot, of, a lot of crazy things that go on in the church worldwide. And then in Medjugorje, I see, I see like a microcosm of that. So we're trying to get people, you know, please just be Catholic, be sound, and do what Holy Mother Church expects of us, rather than making up some mad thing. Okay? Anyone else? No? Okay. So I'll end on that note. Let's just let's pray for Archbishop Hosea and all those who work for the pastoral care of Medjugorje. We'll pray three Hail Marys. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all.